Before we get started, I just wanted to thank all of you for a truly amazing first month. I wasn't expecting the response that Roasted Opinions has gotten from you, and I'm very grateful to all of you for tuning in. I promise to keep working hard to improve the quality of these videos and to keep making content for you to watch. I look forward to reading and responding to your comments on each video. When I expand to two videos a week, I plan to use that second video to respond to the most interesting comments on each new episode so that we really can keep the conversation going about these topics. Thank you, really, for watching, and keep that feedback coming. I think that discussing issues as equals, especially when we don't agree, is one of the most important exercises of free speech in which we can engage. For the last few years, people have really become angry with each other. The atmosphere on social media is quite poisonous at times. Some blame this festering dysfunction on toxic masculinity. Others blame this on toxic femininity. But is it really because of either of these things? When our society discusses issues politely, with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. The concept of toxic masculinity is closely tied to the philosophical principle of patriarchy the belief that the world is male-dominated and framed to benefit men at the expense of women, or all other genders, depending on whether one accepts the gender binary. In this worldview, men have traditionally held all real power in society, economics, and government. They continue to hold the bulk of power in these areas in order to preserve their dominance. Toxic masculinity supposedly manifests in many ways. From violence against women to the destruction of reputations to misogyny to the soft sexism of low expectations. It is theoretically nurtured by traditional values and by some women who limit themselves and other women through a lack of solidarity. Toxic masculinity, therefore, is primarily an intersectional feminist concept. Toxic femininity is in many ways the opposite of toxic masculinity. This concept is tied to the belief that the rejection of traditional and biological imperatives in behavior is destructive to the social contract. The primary source of this concept is found in the members of the men's rights movement. Toxic femininity also supposedly manifests in many ways, from the destruction of reputations to misandry to the deplatforming of men. According to some sources, Violence against men is also a result, and the soft sexism of low expectation plays out again. The belief in toxic femininity is in many ways a response to the concept of toxic masculinity. To those who believe in toxic masculinity, accusations of toxic femininity are another way for toxic males to reassert dominance and support the patriarchy. Yet there are those who believe in toxic femininity under a different definition. Women who support the reputed patriarchy practice truly toxic femininity. Strangely enough, those who believe in toxic femininity do something quite similar with regards to toxic masculinity. They accuse male feminist allies of practicing real toxic masculinity by disguising their true motivation for supporting feminism which is to hook up with feminist women, of course. A fairly short perusal of the Me Too movement will turn up several cases of male feminist allies being accused of some despicable behavior, such as harassment, stalking, and much worse. Ditto a search of men in power abusing their positions, a look at the hyper-aggressive behavior of the most radical elements of feminism, and a consideration of how often some women just have to excuse the bad behavior of some men. There are plenty of examples of toxicity in social interactions to be found, so toxic masculinity and or toxic femininity must be a real thing, right? Um, no. Just, no. 
Masculinity is simply acting in a typically male manner, as determined by those biological and social imperatives which I mentioned before. Likewise, femininity is merely acting in a typically female manner, because of similarly gendered biological and social behavior patterns associated with women. These are group norms derived from biological imperatives and social expectations, and are in no way binding. In layman's terms, it's either natural behavioral norms or nurtured societal mores which provide the basis for what is considered gendered behavior. In both instances, these qualities in and of themselves are not good or bad, they just represent the most successful patterns of behavior to accomplish perhaps the two most important effects in any group, reproduction and group identification. Yes, I said reproduction and group identification. Successful reproduction is more than just giving birth. Children need to be raised into successful adults if they are going to perpetuate both the species overall and contribute to a successful society. They need to be properly educated, both to know how to succeed and achieve by themselves, but also in how to interact with others and contribute to the group. This manifests primarily as a claimed membership to the cultural group to which one feels a close connection. Toxic behaviors violate the social contract within the group no matter who is engaging in such behaviors. Toxicity is not specific to one gender, nor is it ascribed to either traditional or non-traditional behaviors. Some of the best people I know are very traditional in many ways, and the rest of the best people I know are not. Good people exist everywhere. Or at least they used to be everywhere. The real toxicity that I see these days is spreading further. Disregarding and disrespecting those who do not share one's point of view instead of listening to them, discussing with them, persuading them to change their minds and compromising when persuasion falls short. This manifests as labeling everyone who disagrees as part of an outgroup, fracturing the primary social group along political and ideological lines, fostering still more anger and more toxic behavior. There is a natural allegiance to the social group to which one belongs. The problem is that the more tightly defined that social group is, the less social cohesion exists overall as the large societal group is balkanized into progressively more exclusive subgroups. The irrational fear and hatred that people feel for those not like them increases as more and more people are not like them. In short, gender toxicity is just more identitarian politics, and therein lies the problem. Ascribing negative qualifiers to an entire gender or to the behavior of a large portion of the members of a gender only widens the divide between us and creates mutually antagonistic exchanges filled with accusations that are true of specific individuals but patently false when applied to an entire gender. Fostering more divisions and assigning more derogatory negative labels to others won't solve anything. Call out toxic behaviors, certainly, but don't ascribe those behaviors to the gender of the toxic person. Instead, maybe we should consider that those behaviors belong to that individual and that each individual is responsible for the impact and the consequences ascribed to those behaviors. Now, that's just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with it. In fact, I'd love to hear what your opinion is, so go ahead and like or dislike this video. If you have something to say, leave a comment and continue the discussion. If you are interested in hearing what other opinions I have, click the button and ring the bell. New videos post every Saturday at noon central, so watch this space. If you'd like to be a guest on one of my end of month live streams, go ahead and let me know. I'd be happy to have you on.